Welcome to the Scanning Transmission Electron Microscopy Biological Sample Preparation Training Course. This is for the Electron Microscopy Unit at the Central Analytical Facilities in Stellenbosch University. I am Dr. Alicia Buertis, uh, presenting along with Madeleine Frasenberg. So just a brief overview of Scanning Transmission Electron Microscopy and what it is. Scanning Transmission Electron Microscopy uses a beam of electrons instead of light. It consists of an electron emission source, electromagnetic lenses, and an electron detector. A very thin sample is positioned along the electron beam. The electron beam is produced, accelerated, and focused on specific points on samples, passing through and scanning over it. The transmitted beam is then detected, and this creates an image down to the atomic resolution. So what we will be discussing today is just a brief history of the STEM, and then some requirements that are crucial for samples during STEM analysis, and then also just the sample preparation procedures, and we will be discussing uh, in brief the STEM grids and some calibration standards. So in 1925, Louis de Broglie theorized that the wave-like properties of electrons have a wavelength much smaller than visible light. In 1933, Aaron Siliska utilized this theory and invented the first electron microscope. He also received a Nobel Prize in Physics for it, which he shared in 1986 with Benich and Rohrer. The first stem was built by von Arden in 1938 in Berlin. There are some crucial requirements for samples uh, for scanning transmission electron microscopy analysis. Firstly, samples should be very thin and uniformly flat. The samples need to be parallel sided and in the correct orientation. It also needs to have the correct side of interest selected and prepared. The sample should be clean with no defects or contaminations to prevent artifacts. Sections that are selected should be representable of the whole sample if possible. So sample preparation procedures are vast in electron microscopy and uh, it varies quite a bit for each sample but we will be discussing some of the main procedures and some of the most popular methods. So firstly, fixation is very important for a sample preparation. Fixation of the specimen stabilizes the cell so that further change or damage to the cell will not happen. Through this process, the sample is preserved to give a snapshot in time of the living cell. Fixation can be done through two methods as follows. Chemical fixation. This method is used for stabilizing biological samples. Chemical substances are used to cross-link protein molecules with nearby molecules. The most frequently used chemical in this method is glutaraldehyde. But like we discussed in SIM, there are also other types of fixatives available. Cryofixation. This method involves rapid freezing of the sample in either liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. The water content in the sample thus gets transformed into a vitreous ice form. It is not necessary for a cryophase specimen to undergo all these procedures. It can be directly subjected to cutting and then shadowed using vapors of platinum or gold, or even carbon before visualization under the stem. So following fixation, there are a few important steps that need to be conducted. Rinsing is very important because the tissue fixation process may cause increased acidity in the specimen. To prevent this condition and maintain the pH, it should be rinsed properly using a buffer such as sodium cacodylate. Secondary fixation is also important to increase the contrast of the minute structures inside the specimen and to give it more stability. A secondary fixation is carried out using osmium tetroxide, normally. Without inducing any change in the feature of the structure, osmium transforms the proteins into gels and increases the contrast between nearby cytoplasms by binding regions of the phospholipid heads. Then the following step would be dehydration, which is a crucial step indeed. Freeze drying or dehydration of the specimen is the process by which the water content in the specimen is replaced with an organic solvent. Ethanol and acetone are the frequently used solvents in this method. Dehydration is important as the epoxy resin used in the further steps does not mix with water. And even without the epoxy resin, it is still important to have a dry sample. The ethanol series that we use in SIM can also be applied here for the drying of the sample. Before the dehydration step. Staining for biological samples are usually done twice. This is before dehydration, a more selective staining, and then after sectioning 
In this process, heavy metals like uranium, lead, or tungsten are used to increase the contrast between different structures in the specimen and also to scatter the electron beams. Then we move on to infiltration. This is normally done using an epoxy resin. This penetrates the cell, which will then occupy the space and make the sample hard enough to bear the pressure of sectioning or cutting. This process is also called embedding. The resin is then kept in an oven at 60 degrees overnight to allow for setting. This process is called polymerization. Then we have polishing. As we mentioned, we need the sample to be completely uniform flat. After embedding, some materials are subjected to polishing. Polishing specimens reduces scratches and other defects. So this helps remove anything that can minimize the quality of the image. Ultra-fine abrasives are used to give the specimen a mirror-like finish. Then we have cutting. So this is a very crucial and final step. For study under an electron microscope, the sample should be semi-transparent to allow the passage of electron beams through it. To achieve this semi-transparent nature, the sample is sectioned into fine sections using a glass or diamond knife, normally attached to a device known as an ultramicrotome. Once the sections are cut, they are moved to a copper grid to be viewed under the microscope. So here I'm just showing you a quick example of a sample preparation procedure. So the steps are to firstly start with the primary fixation, which is normally 2.5% glutaraldehyde uh, in a phosphate buffer or cacodylate buffer. Then we move on to a post fixation with 1% osmium tetroxide. This darkens the surfaces it binds to, so it provides a very clear contrast. And then number three is where we stain with uh, uh, usually a urinal acetate at 1%. Uh, in 70% uh, ethanol because this will help with the um, solubility of the urinal acetate and then prevent some precipitation to form and it also helps the urinal acetate to penetrate the tissue faster. Uranium is a heavy metal. When it binds to proteins and lipids, its high electron density produces a clear contrast within the sample. So step 4 is to prepare the epoxy resin, if you require it. There are many different types of embedding media but epoxy resin is the most widely used and best option for morphological studies. Araldite and epon resin are the most popular. Number five is to infiltrate with the resin via propylene oxide. Since araldite and epon are not reactive with alcohols, propylene oxide acts as a transition solvent between the alcohol dehydrations and epoxy resin. The graded process shifts from 100% propylene oxide to 100% resin. The propylene oxide is volatile and highly toxic and potentially carcinogenic, so it's very important to wear your PPEs. You can also have an alternative where you use acetone as the transition fluid. The next step is sectioning, and we will discuss this in more detail later. So staining is a very crucial part of preparing your samples, especially if it's biological samples, so you can have an improved contrast and see everything you wish to see in your sample. Staining in biological specimens is usually done twice, like we mentioned, before dehydration and after sectioning. Staining before dehydration is done in block, while in staining after sectioning, the sample is exposed briefly to an aqueous solution of metals. In this process, heavy metals like uranium, lead or tungsten are used to increase the contrast between different structures in the specimen and to scatter the electron beam. So negative staining is normally used when we talk about staining in scanning transmission electron microscopy. In this instance, contrast is not applied to the object but to its environment, using heavy metal salts. This causes the electron beam to cross biological material easier than the surrounding space. Some of the important factors and problems that need to be considered during the staining process is that the selection must be in accordance with the pH and the electrical charge of the sample, as well as the contrasting solution and the EM grid. Resulting precipitates and the lack of spreading of the sample are the most common inconveniences caused during the preparation. Besides the stains, the factors such as fixatives buffers, rinse water, and the dehydration steps, the rinsing time, the type of embedding medium, and the level of polymerization of the medium, as well as the sectioning thickness, influences the contrast as well. 
It has been indicated that fixation time has an effect on contrast obtained by urinal acetate contrasting. So the way that buffers can influence the contrast of a sample is by interacting very strongly with the urinal acetate. So the cacodylate and phosphate ions can uh, tend to uh, react too strongly with the urinal acetate and create salt precipitation. Therefore, a higher contrast without precipitation is obtained when washing the samples after fixation extensively. Phosphate buffers can remain in the tissue even after dehydration and embedding, and often gives rise to small local dense deposits in muscles and nerve tissue. So it is extremely important to make sure that you are using the correct amount of buffer, and then also rinse properly afterwards. So sometimes, during rinsing even, you can introduce CO2 into the sample which can react with some of the metal stains, such as forming lead carbonate precipitation with lead citrate. So if distilled water is allowed to stand for a long period of time, the carbon dioxide uh, is dissolved from the air into the water and this can cause a problem later when you start using it. So it's also important to use fresh distilled water each time. So like we mentioned, the most important problem you'll probably find when you start with sample preparation for scanning transmission electron microscopy is clumping or agglomeration. This can usually be prevented by diluting your sample properly or by using some other methods as these researchers have done. In the first image, the hepatitis B antigen is shown, where the virus particles are joined together in groups. Then in the next image, the hepatitis B antigen was suspended just as the previous sample, but what they did is they used an electron microscope grid formerly coated with polylysine and this allowed for the virus particles to be more spread out over the grid. So there are all these types of research and studies and literature that you can use to find solutions to your problems. It is also a good idea to speak to analysts of microscopes to establish a good procedure that will work for your sample. There are a few types of stains. Phosphotungstic acid is a heteropoly acid often used together with hematoxylin. PTA binds with fibrin, collagen, and fibers of connective tissue. It replaces the anions of dyes from these materials and selectively discolors them. Urinal acetate is the most popular. Uh, this enhances the contrast by interaction with lipids and proteins and forms a yellow needle-like crystal precipitate if not used in the right concentration and if redundant UA is not removed from the section. It is also important to not expose the UA to UV light. Then we have lead citrate. The double contrast method of ultra-thin sections on grids with urinal acetate and lead citrate is a standard routine contrasting technique for EM. It enhances the contrast by interacting with proteins and glycogens, and it will form a water-insoluble toxic white precipitate if not used strictly under CO2-free conditions. The enhancement of the contrasting effect depends on the interaction with reduced osmium since it allows the attachment of lead ions to the polar groups of molecules. Here is a sample of a bacterium. Note the fine structures in the very good image presented by the proper staining method. So the stains we are discussing here are just the most popular. There are many products out there available for each type of sample. Uh, the next few stains that we will mention is hematoxylin and osmium tetroxide. Hematoxylin stains cell nuclei blue and in combination with other stains can show the layout of a cell. It usually is paired with something like eosin. Osmium tetroxide is a good fixative and excellent stain for lipids in membranes and structures in vesicles. So earlier we spoke of sectioning and uh, preparing thin sections and here we discussed it in more detail. Uh, there are a few methods available but the most popular will be ultramicrotome. But uh, there's also other things such as ion mining and electrolytic thinning. In ion mining, charged argon ions are fired at the sample surface until it becomes transparent enough. Electrolytic thinning, also known as jet polishing, um, is used to reduce thickness to 100 nanometers by placing the specimen in an electrochemical cell as an anode. And then we have the ultramicrotome. The sample is reduced to a very small section by mounting the sample onto a holder against a cutting tool, which is usually a diamond knife or a glass knife. There are some disadvantages of each of these methods, 
Iron mining can lead to differential milling, uh, which distorts the sample. The electrolytic thinning is mostly useful for conductor specimens only. And then we have the ultramicrotome, which can sometimes cause compressions in artifacts uh, in materials that are softer, or if the embedding didn't go properly and the epoxy is still not completely set. So finally, we will be discussing some of the specimen grid types, and we will just be briefly brushing over some of the most important ones. Because the specimen is so thin and small, it must fit on a 3x3mm copper grid. Any data obtained from TIM analysis is not necessarily representative of the entire sample, therefore. So there are quite a variety of grid types available for each type of sample and anything that you require for your sample. These grids can range from 25 to 100 microns, and the whole width can vary from 25 to 288 microns. So some of the grids that are available are pure copper, pure nickel, pure gold, copper with rhodium flash on one face, stainless steel, tungsten, aluminium, molybdenum, nickel with pure gold flash on one side, copper with pure gold flash on one side, and then copper with palladium flash on one side, carbon nylon grids, carbon composite grids, and then beryllium grids. And that's just to name a few. Carbon nylon grids are used as a low background support membrane. And then carbon composite grids have no titanium contamination and are more thermally stable than most grids. Then you have aluminium and beryllium grids which are especially useful for x-ray analysis to reduce background counts due to the element's low atomic number in the grid material. Then you have the stainless steel grids which provide an economical alternative to etched grids. You also get hexagonal holes, slotted holes, and grids with special patterns, and also coordinated grids with a numbering system. And then we have the diamond tem grids. They have unique properties. They display a thermal conductivity roughly four times that of copper. That means heat is carried away more effectively. Grids are formed by chemical milling, also known as etching, uh, or electroforming, also known as deposition. There are so many options available for your sample specifically. For example, for nanotechnology and molecular biology research, you get silicon nitride thin film windows. So for example, a cell can be grown on the film, uh, in their environment, and then subsequently analyzed. It's also useful for polymer research, such as nanoparticles, thin films, and material science research. Now, I'd quickly like to mention uh, calibration standards. You get various types like lattice, plane specimens, and perforated carbon films that help check the microscope resolution, astigmentation, and microscope stability. There are many types of calibration standards for STEM, uh, especially for STEM magnification, diffraction, and X-ray analysis. Thank you for listening, and any questions are welcome.